Good morning. So today we have a massive case update. The remains of Suzanne Morphew have been found. This is a big deal. She went for a bicycle ride, supposedly, on Mother's Day 2020. And there's a lot of circumstantial evidence pointing at her husband, Barry. The police brought him in and decided they didn't have enough evidence and the case was dismissed, but they do have the option to prosecute again. And now that her remains have been found, I suspect they will. Um, it, it's a really difficult situation. The daughters have stood by him this entire time. They absolutely believe their father did not do this. And according to a statement released through Barry's lawyer, they had actually hoped that she was still alive, which seems unlikely. And, you know, he was claiming animal attacks and all kinds of things. Uh, last May, 2023, Barry filed a $15 million lawsuit for uh, his arrest. And uh, I think that's going to definitely be in question now. So, it's, it's an unfortunate thing to confirm that Suzanne is gone, but I think most people, um, both in the public sphere and in her personal life, had come to terms with that. Uh, I have a really hard time believing that Barry or his daughters honestly believed that she was coming home. I feel for them, um, unless her remains have some kind of evidence demonstrating that someone else was involved with her murder, I really think it's likely that Barry's going away for this. And that's got to be hell on these girls who are completely innocent. And I think it's not difficult to imagine wanting your father to be innocent of killing your mother. I, they're, they're adults, but still. I lost both of my parents a couple years ago, a little over a year apart, and even at my age, I felt orphaned and alone, and, um, you know, I, their dad's still going to be alive, they'll still be able to talk to him, but having your father in prison for killing your mother has got to be painful, and I wish those girls luck, and... I, I hope they find peace with whatever the outcome of this is. So I'm going to do a little refresher overview of the case here, but if you really want something in depth and detailed, a lot of people have covered it. I'd probably recommend either Stephanie Harlow or Kendall Ray for this case. So stay safe, listen to your instincts, and I will be back soon. Bye. I am seriously sending good juju, energy, vibes, prayers, however you want to put it. My thoughts genuinely go out to Suzanne Morphew's loved ones. I can't imagine what that's like to, you know, probably know that she's gone, but be able to hold on to that slight hope and that kind of devastation and re-feeling the loss of someone you loved but I imagine there's also relief in having that I don't know closure is such a loaded word but knowing for sure has got to be some kind of relief I think I don't know I, I it's got to feel like losing her again some mothers you might not care that much, but when you love your mother, when you have a close relationship, it's one of the most painful losses you can experience. Um, you know, I imagine losing a child is the top, but losing your mom, it hurts. And uh, losing your mom to violence Losing your mom to violence, likely perpetrated by your father, has got to be a nightmare. I hope they find answers, and I hope 
they're able to find peace in those answers. All right. Um, stay safe. All of that I already said, so... Suzanne and Barry grew up in Alexandria, Indiana. They met in high school. She was popular. He was a star baseball player who was drafted by the Toronto Blue Jays. They started dating after he graduated high school. Um, shortly before they got married, Suzanne was diagnosed with Hodgkin's lymphoma. They married in 1994. Barry started his landscaping business, BLM Enterprises, in 2004 and he's a volunteer firefighter in Colorado. Suzanne was a school teacher before leaving her job to be a stay-at-home mom. They had two daughters, Mallory and Macy, and Suzanne had a charity, the Suzanne R. Morphew Hope Foundation. Um, she started it in 2012. In 2018, they moved from Arcadia, Indiana to Salida, Colorado, and some reports are that it was to be close to Mallory, who was in school there. There's a lot of speculation that it was a chance to restart a troubled marriage. They were already having problems. But things were still pretty rocky in 2020. The text messages between Suzanne and a friend show that she was definitely not happy in her marriage. In one text, she writes, I feel no peace when he's here and I would not feel safe alone with him. On March 25th, Suzanne texted a friend, he won't speak of divorce. May 6th, just a few days before she disappeared, Suzanne had texted Barry, I'm done. I could care less what you're up to and have been for years. We just need to figure this out civilly. They argued over finances, she suspected that he was having an affair. She was, in fact, having an affair. And I really haven't seen much suggesting that Barry knew about her affair or was even particularly suspicious that she might be having one. Suzanne was having an ongoing relationship with a married father of six from Michigan named Jeff. I believe it's Liebler. I'm going to do the majority of this overview just as a timeline. I think that's the most logical way to go about it. Saturday, May 9th. According to an employee, Morgan Gentile, he had seemed stressed out. He was, quote, weird on Saturday. She had expected to work a full day, but he sent her home before noon. He said he was going to go spend time with his wife. Quote, he said that he had to go make the wife happy, do some hiking or biking. And I found out later that day that he was in town all day. Apparently, he was in Salida shopping by himself. Suzanne was at home. She shared a few social media posts and spent most of the afternoon texting back and forth with Jeff. At 59 messages, they apparently talked more than normal. Suzanne sent Jeff a selfie that is now considered the proof of life photo. It's the last time she is absolutely known to have been alive. Around 2 p.m., she and Jeff moved their conversation to WhatsApp. Um, it had apparently become a little bit explicit. Barry was out running errands, and at 2.26, he texted Suzanne telling her he was on his way home. She did not respond. He texted her again, asking, did you leave? And she didn't respond to that. Apparently, he arrived home at 2.30. I personally find it a little weird that within a four minute span to text twice, and if you're going to give notice that you're on your way home, that's, that's not a normal window right before you pull up. So at 2.30, Barry arrived home and his phone is pinging all over the place in the house. It's completely erratic. When asked about it, he claims that he was chasing chipmunks. Um, 
The police believe that he may have been chasing Suzanne around the house, shooting her with a tranquilizer gun, but he claims he was shooting chipmunks. Now this place, it is massive. It's a mansion. I didn't realize a phone could be tracked from room to room like that. I thought more general area, you know, tell that you're at home, not which room you're in. From 2.47 to 10.17 p.m., Barry's phone was locked in airplane mode. According to Barry, they just spent a quiet night home together and they went to bed at eight. There are no messages from her out to anyone. Jeff, her kids, she's never heard from again. Despite saying that he went to bed at eight, there is evidence from the electrical system of his truck. His Ford pickup shows that it was backed up and moved closer to the house at 9.30 p.m. His phone was turned back on about an hour later. So the 8 p.m. bedtime doesn't really seem valid. So as of May 10th, the Morphews were viewed as a very happy, ideal family. Later, evidence would come out that Barry had a bad temper. Um, there were rumors of him having affairs. There's evidence of her having an affair. And it was definitely fractured. The family was very faith-centered though. And it's a little odd. Apparently, Barry would make time to be sure to be home on Sundays. Suzanne would go on a bike ride in the morning, they would go to church, and they were very connected Sundays as a family. So to me, it's a little bit weird that Sunday, Mother's Day, they'd all be gone. Apparently, the girls were planning to get back from their camping trip on the afternoon of Mother's Day and be able to see their mom. And Barry just decided he was going to work. On the morning of May 10th, Barry claims that when he headed out in the morning for his job 140 miles away, Suzanne was still sleeping. I'm, there are a lot of conflicting reports. Barry had texted her Happy Mother's Day, but she didn't respond to it. The girls apparently also texted her Happy Mother's Day and did not get a response. There are a few variations on the story, but the most consistent seems to be that Mallory, unable to reach her mom, reaches out to Barry, who calls a neighbor. The neighbor finds no sign of Suzanne or her bike, and Barry asks her to call police. Barry then drops off some tools for his co-workers at the hotel he'd booked, and heads home around 6 p.m. Investigators discovered that Barry had thrown out trash at dumpsters in multiple locations. Barry told them that he often drops trash in whatever dumpster is available to save money. Barry called employee Morgan Gentile and asked her to assemble a crew for a job building a retaining wall. The job had already been pushed back twice and she had expected it would only be herself and Barry working on it. At the last minute, he decided he wanted her to put together a crew and meet up there. She said he sounded frantic and didn't sound like himself, but she agreed to pick up Jeffrey Puckett and headed to Broomfield. Barry called her again around 6.10 p.m. and said that he had been up there all day getting the job ready, but there was a family emergency and he wouldn't be there. He said he left some tools behind at the hotel, but the tools that they needed weren't there. Barry asked the crew to finish the job, so they waited at the hotel for further instructions. At the hotel, both Morgan and Jeffrey Puckett describe an eye-burning stench of chlorine and wet towels all over the room. A third employee, Cassidy Cordova, does not seem to want to make any public statement whatsoever. Puckett spoke to local media and described the scent of chlorine and thought the pool was open, but it wasn't. Due to COVID, it had been closed for a while. Puckett said it appeared as though Barry had taken a shower and there were towels all over the floor. A manager for the Holiday Inn Express confirmed that the pool was closed and that housekeeping staff do not use chlorine. Puckett also said he found a letter in the trash concerning property insurance. He turned the letter over to investigators. It strikes me a little bit weird that you would 
go through the trash at a hotel room and find a letter and keep it when it without knowing that anyone is missing it seems like that would just be a typical business form but apparently according to news reports jeff stated my first thought was alibi when i found the mail the next morning it just kind of looked like an alibi Barry was caught by surveillance cameras arriving at the hotel on May 10th, carrying several bags of trash and clothing. Monday morning, Barry called Morgan and informed her that Suzanne had been attacked by a mountain lion and that the materials for the job were on their way. The materials never arrived and Morgan and Jeffrey Puckett drove back to Salida on Tuesday. She says she didn't want to call and bother him about the materials when his wife was missing. But when she got back to town, she claims that she was approached by two friends of Barry. Um, it's a little muddled, but they apparently tried to intimidate her and encourage her not to cooperate with the investigation. Morgan opted to cooperate. She turned her phone over to the FBI and she did multiple interviews. Apparently the next time she heard from Barry was when he fired her via text. She claims that it was because she was speaking out and cooperating with the authorities. He claims it's because she was a meth head and that anything she says couldn't be trusted. We don't know if that's true, but we do know that Jeff Puckett would later pass from a meth related death. But Morgan claimed she was afraid of Barry and never wanted to see him again. The search for Suzanne was huge. Over a hundred people showed up. There was an initial reward of a hundred thousand dollars offered. It was a thorough search using dogs and drones when her bike was found, it had been thrown off the side of the road, but this area had been searched by dogs. So either the dogs missed it or there was no scent of Suzanne on the bike when it went over. From the moment he returned home, Barry believed it was an animal attack. Over the next couple of days, that would shift into a kidnapping, but he apparently initially told everyone it was a mountain lion. I don't know about Colorado, but I'm in Washington and we also have a lot of mountain lion here. I'm only aware of one fatality by mountain lion in the last hundred years. Maybe there are more in Colorado, but it does seem like a strange thing to leap to immediately, especially for someone who is a avid hunter who spends time amongst wildlife and in the mountains, in the forest, who knows or should know animal behavior. It's not a common thing. Cougar are not just coming out attacking bicyclists. Um, generally, they'll avoid humans. It's not impossible. A cougar attack, even a cougar taking someone and dragging them to their den. It's not impossible, but it's, it's fairly unlikely. And to me, it's a really strange thing for him to jump to immediately, especially with the knowledge he should have about their behavior. The sheriff's office, search and rescue, the Department of Corrections, the combined tag team, Drones and tracking dogs were involved. The FBI and other local agencies, including the Salida Police Department, joined the search. No clothing, blood, or evidence of a struggle was found near the bite. Her sunglasses and hydration backpack were found inside her car, and investigators came to think the entire scene was staged. On May 15th, her bike helmet was found just off Route 50, undamaged. Photos were taken of Barry's scratched up arms, which he claimed were the result of his search for his wife in the forest. A family friend matched Barry's initial $100,000 reward, bringing the total to $200,000. On May 17th, Barry released the infamous No Questions Asked video. In this video, he's pleading for the return of his wife 
and he seems positive that this is now a kidnapping. It's no longer an animal attack. Oh, Suzanne, if anyone is out there that can hear this, that has you, please, we'll do whatever it takes to bring you back. We love you, we miss you, your girls need you. No questions asked, however much they want. I will do whatever it takes to get you back. Honey, I love you, and I want you back so bad. Tips are pouring in, and while investigators claim to have followed up on at least 1,400 tips, there were reports of tips going ignored. Initially, Barry seemed to help the investigation. He made his home and property available, all the electronics, and he went through interrogations and supposedly did not hire a lawyer from the beginning but he did not participate in the search with other members of the family. In their search, investigators found a spy pen in a walk-in closet in the master bedroom. It was a voice-activated recorder that was apparently intended to catch Barry in an affair, but actually just recorded evidence that Suzanne was having an affair. It took six months for investigators to identify Jeff. He never came forward on his own and he did take steps to hide their affair, which is understandable when you're married with six kids. Once agents did show up, he was cooperative. He gave his DNA, phone records, passwords, everything that they wanted. Investigators were able to verify his alibi and they ruled him out as a suspect pretty quickly. Along the door frame in the master bedroom, there is a big crack. Investigators believe it may have been caused in the struggle between Barry and Suzanne that night. Uh, Barry's response was that he had no idea what it was from. Investigators also discovered a clear plastic needle cap in the dryer. Investigators believe that when he returned home on May 9th, he had taken the cap off a syringe, loaded a tranquilizer dart, injected the dart with a chemical, and shot Suzanne. They did not find a tranquilizer gun or chemicals in the home. Barry said that he had no idea how the cap got in the dryer, but admitted he was an experienced trank dart shooter, and he knows how to load darts with paralyzing chemicals. He admitted to illegally sedating deer to remove their antlers to sell. At first, everyone coming forward said wonderful things about Barry. He's the most amazing man. He would never hurt her. They had the perfect marriage. They were madly in love. But then things started coming out about his temperament, employees who had problems with him, business dealings where he was known to not be the nicest man. And then the texts revealing her deep unhappiness with her marriage. In September 2020, Suzanne's brother, Andy Mormon, arrived. He organized a team of dozens of volunteers from around the country. They didn't really turn up anything, but Andrew's search included sonar, drones, and dogs. Barry allowed the search on his property, but did not participate. One of the participants reported an armed man informing him that he was on private property. It's unconfirmed, but seems likely that this was Barry. Months since Suzanne Morphew went out for a bike ride on Mother's Day. And after countless searches, there's little information about what happened to her. Her family, though, is determined to find out. Number 7's Lance Fernandez joins us live in Chafee County. And Lance, you spoke with her brother, and he says they just want closure, right? He said that's what he and his family want. He says not knowing where his sister is is taking a toll on the family. So today he and several of the hundred or so volunteers who gathered here this morning focused their search on the area where his sister lived. I'm going to go out by the Morphew home. Andrew Mormon instructing volunteers who gathered at the visitor center in Poncha Springs. We're looking for torn clothing human remains and things of that nature. Some of the volunteers went up to Dead Horse Gulch, others to Puma Path near Suzanne Morphew's home. That area was the focus of the investigation early on. The pink ribbon at the bottom. Morphew's bike was found at the bottom of this hill. Upside down leaning against the tree. But there was no blood or evidence of injury, which makes her brother think. It was thrown over here, it's planted evidence, yeah, without question. 
Searchers combed on foot through this heavily treed area. One group found a mound of earth that looked freshly overturned. They started digging, but found no evidence of the missing woman. On a nearby mountain, Andrew told us he's afraid of what he might find and afraid of what he might not find. I asked which would be worse. Not finding. Not finding would be the worst. But the best I'll be able to get out of that is at least I gave it a damn big effort. And happy to chalk off areas, you know yep. what I mean? Mormon said he wants to find his little sister and take her home. He said they'll continue searching through Monday if necessary. Now, one volunteer from Grand Junction says he approached a man. Another man approached him with a shotgun slung over his shoulder. He said that man wouldn't provide his name, but told him he was on private property. He can't help but think that was Barry Morphew. We we're told Morphew is not taking part in this search. In Chafee County, Lance Hernandez, Denver 7. In October 2020, Barry listed the house for sale. He said his daughters couldn't live there. They were afraid to be there, particularly if Suzanne had been kidnapped. They wouldn't want to be in that home. And the media coverage had led to people coming and wandering through the property, recording the family and just causing problems. That same month, a county clerk reported to the sheriff's office that she had received a mail-in ballot for Suzanne, who she knew was missing, and some potentially exculpatory evidence was found. I think this is one of the most important things in the case, and I rarely hear anything about it. Investigators discovered male DNA in Suzanne's Range Rover. The testing revealed a partial match to an unknown man connected to three unsolved sexual assaults in Tempe, Phoenix, and Chicago. May 5th, Barry is arrested. Despite still not having a body, Barry was charged with first degree murder and tampering with physical evidence. In their arrest affidavit, prosecutors said that they believed Suzanne had decided to leave him and he, quote, resorted to something he had done his entire life, hunt and control Suzanne like he had hunted and controlled animals. District Attorney Linda Stanley charged Barry with murder and the disappearance of Suzanne. She didn't reveal what evidence she had, but seemed very assured that there was enough to convict. Barry's trial was set to start in April, 2022. On May 14th, 2021, Barry was charged with forgery of a public record and election mail ballot offense. Barry supposedly didn't realize it was illegal to use his missing wife's ballot. He had done it, quote, just because I wanted Trump to win. I just thought, give him another vote. <laughs> August 9th, 2021, preliminary hearings begin in Barry's trial. County Sheriff Commander Alex Walker came forward with evidence that Suzanne had had a two year long affair before her disappearance. She and Jeff had met up at least six times in Louisiana, Texas, Indiana, and Florida. Walker testified that the FBI had met with the boyfriend and he was not a target of the investigation. He also testified that Suzanne suspected that Barry was having an affair, but there was no evidence that he was. A preliminary hearing is held to determine if there's enough evidence to proceed with a trial. And at this point, they decided there was. The case against Barry was strong enough to go to trial. Barry pleaded not guilty to all charges. And on September 20th, he was released from jail on bond, his daughters by his side. November 8th, 2021, 454 pages of documents in the case were released by a judge. This includes motions, filings, court orders, and a 500 person witness list. On January 28th, 2022, the judge released pictures of Barry's hands and arms with scratch marks. Of course, the defense claims it was tree branches during the search and the prosecutors believe it was from Suzanne trying to defend herself. They laid out the theory that Barry had used a tranquilizer dart on Suzanne, claiming that the needle cap in the dryer fits the needle that's used to inject serum into a dart. In October 2020, Barry Morphew is reported to have met Shoshana Dark. Shoshana cleaned houses for a real estate group. Apparently the two met at a dumpster. 
there had been a tip to law enforcement in December 2020 that they were engaged in an intimate relationship. An FBI camera installed near Dark's home caught Morphew consistently coming and going, sometimes staying through the night. While she denies that it was a romantic relationship, there is additional surveillance footage from a Colorado Springs hotel a couple days before Valentine's Day of 2021 with Dark carrying a large bouquet of flowers. September 27th, the new owner of Barry's home reports to the Sheriff's Department that he got an alert of a security trigger on his property. Shoshana Dark is seen approaching the house and leaving with a cardboard box under her arm. She's charged with trespassing, but I can't find anything revealing what that box was, whether she was removing something that Barry had left behind or maybe Barry had had something delivered to that old address. Um, it's not a big deal, probably, but it's something I'm just curious about. And on April 19th, 2022, prosecutors dropped charges against him. The prosecutors said they didn't have a case without the testimony of expert witnesses the judge had ruled to exclude. His trial was supposed to begin April 28th. Fremont County District Judge Ramsey Lama granted a motion filed by prosecutors asking to dismiss the case without prejudice so that charges could be filed again at a later date. Barry's attorney, Iris Iden, claimed that the case was dismissed because they were going to lose. She claims that Barry was going to be acquitted and exonerated. District Attorney Linda Stanley filed a motion that asked Judge Lama to dismiss the case without prejudice, claiming that prosecutors were close to the discovery of Suzanne's body, but they wouldn't be able to complete the search ahead of the scheduled trial date due to the snowpack. Judge Lama barred 11 of their 16 endorsed expert witnesses. This included experts in DNA, vehicle data, and a cell phone data analyst. They were barred as punishment for violating discovery rules. In a series of pretrial motions, the defense pressed judges to impose sanctions on the prosecution for failing to turn over potentially exculpatory evidence ahead of trial. In all, the court excluded 14 of the prosecution's expert witnesses, without which the prosecution felt their case had been severely weakened. Regarding District Attorney Stanley and her team, Judge Lama wrote, it is clear to this court, there is a pattern of discovery violations in this case attributed to the people. Their actions amount to negligent and arguably reckless disregard. In earlier filings, prosecutors said that the court did not find willful misconduct associated with any discovery violations, noting ultimately the sanctions imposed greatly damaged the people's case tantamount to dismissal for late disclosures that were not greatly prejudicial rather than technical in nature. So basically the prosecution was breaking the rules, not in a way that affected the substance of the case, but still discovery violations. And the judge punished them by taking away their expert witnesses. Without expert witnesses and without a body, I think the prosecution was basically forced to drop the case against him. After the case was dismissed, Barry filed a $15 million lawsuit. He claims county prosecutors, CBI and FBI employees, quote, engaged in actions including malicious prosecution and unlawful detention, fabrication of evidence, conspiracy, unlawful retention of property, reckless investigation and failure to supervise and train. Because of their conduct, he was charged, arrested and prosecuted and his property seized for a crime he did not commit. As a result, he spent five months in jail, six months more wearing an ankle monitor with severe restrictions on his movement and almost a year was spent defending against criminal charges. The lawsuit alleges that his name and reputation have been irreparably tarnished in Colorado and all around the country, and that he suffered loss of familial association with his two daughters, which doesn't seem to be the case. They seem to have stood by him the entire time. 
as well as great economic losses, the loss of his home, business savings, and much more. According to Barry, investigators got tunnel vision. They, quote, they've got too much pride to say they were wrong and look somewhere else. Barry says he doesn't have anything to worry about because he's done nothing wrong. The latest twist comes from her husband's attorney. She's now asking the state to launch an investigation into the elected district attorney who filed the charges. Almost exactly one year since Barry Morphew walked out of this Fremont County courtroom with all the charges against him dropped in the death of his wife, Suzanne. Morphew's defense attorney, Iris Eton, is calling out the prosecutors who had him arrested. Their case was baseless to begin with. She's accusing elected district attorney Linda Stanley. For me, today is a good day. Of concealing evidence and other serious misconduct. Their affidavit they filed was like a tabloid filled with misrepresentations. Eton wants the state's Office of Attorney Regulation Council to investigate DA Stanley and six other prosecutors involved in Morphew's case. I 100% believe, as my team does, that Barry Morphew is innocent. In this recently filed 80 plus page complaint, she claims there is absolute proof prosecutors committed ethical violations, justifying severe discipline and disbarment. She has a license to practice law more powerful than most other individuals in this entire country. I don't believe she should have a right to prosecute other human beings. And it's not just Eton raising concerns. Last week, a Fremont County judge threw out murder charges in another case to punish DA Stanley for failing to hand over evidence, stating, the district attorney's pattern of neglect reveals an urgent and serious need for the district attorney to modify its discovery practices. These public officials need to follow the law just like all the rest of us do. The judge lists more than 20 cases in the last two years where the DA's office failed to turn over evidence as required by law. What is your message to Linda Stanley and the prosecutors in her office? My message to Linda Stanley is do your job, follow the law, follow the rules, stop victimizing people in your community. Morphew's attorney also wants prosecutors across the state to be held accountable. She says right now they face no real punishment for misconduct. She's calling on lawmakers to make it possible to sue prosecutors and hold them personally liable. Anna Shannon, we did reach out to the district attorney's office for comment about what the attorney is alleging here, and she has not gotten back to us. Mallory and Macy told ABC News that the last three years have been a nightmare and that they have never doubted their father's innocence. On September 22nd, 2023, human remains were found during an unrelated search in Moffat, Colorado. By September 27th, the remains had been identified as those of Suzanne. The El Paso County coroner confirmed the identity on Wednesday. Specific information about the location and state of the remains are being withheld at this time. I know I would be very interested to know at least the position and condition of the remains. If they were buried, how deeply they were buried, what kind of predation may have taken place, whether they were in um, a grave, whether they were in a suitcase or submerged in water. We don't know anything. Barry's attorney released a statement after it had been announced that her remains were found. It reads in part, Barry is with his daughters and they are all struggling with this immense shock and grief after learning today that their mother and wife, whom they deeply love, was found deceased. They had faith that their wife and mom would walk back into their lives again. The news is heartbreaking. And then it goes on to proclaim Barry's innocence. Apparently, neither the DA nor authorities notified Mallory and Macy about the recovery. The officials say that the family had been notified before they went public with the information. So that's what we have for now. And hopefully this will be sorted out soon. Overall, to me, I think there is a strong circumstantial case against Barry. Still, I cannot get that DNA from her car out of my head. Three sexual assaults committed by an individual. Who was he? Why was he in her car? How often had he been in her car? How have they not narrowed down who this person is? Um, 
I have a lot of questions about that. And I guess you could say I have reasonable doubt because of it. So that's a little overview of the Suzanne Morphew case. As you know, this is intended to be a channel about issues relating to the true crime community. This is not a channel that covers cases. The updates of major cases are part of that. They're things that people are gonna be talking about and wondering about. So if you want further information, I guarantee you there are wonderful channels working very hard right now to put together videos that'll be coming out about the discovery of the remains and further information going forward. I may do a little, you know, five, 10 minute video on future updates when something big happens, but this has bordered on case coverage to the point that I just want to clarify that's not my intention. This is not a video on the Suzanne Morphew case. There are already those out there. This is just a little overview um, as part of the discussion of the remains being found. I, I hope that distinction is clear. I'm, I'm not that kind of channel. <laughs> I just wanted to do an update about her remains being found and I felt like I needed to give a little background about the case in case people needed a refresher or were unfamiliar with it. Um, this is not intended to be a full case coverage. This is not a deep dive. Stay safe, listen to your instincts, and I'll be back soon. In my personal update, I have a game changer here. I have hearing aids, which you really can't see. Um, I'm, I'm impressed by that. And I can actually hear things that I haven't really heard in a long, long time. I've been living with hearing impairment and chronic idiopathic ear pain for my entire life and this is the first time I've had access to real working medical grade hearing aids and it's only been about 10 minutes I didn't even realize that I don't hear my own voice in daily life until it's suddenly like echoing and screaming in my head and it's a really bizarre feeling to hear myself speak and this is just, it's gonna change a lot of things for me. And hopefully it will add to improving my work here, to getting videos out that are better quality. Um, I don't have a lot of equipment. I don't have tech knowledge. I don't have money. So it's my phone. That That's all I really have, but now I can hear. I can hear what you hear. I I can be more alert to background noises, like a bus or something behind me right now. It's amazing. Um, and I hope it will lead to better quality. And So now I can hear all of these background noises that have probably been bothering anyone who's watching. Like that very loud truck. So... Can you see them? No? Anyway, so that is my personal update. It's big for me. It's really, really big for me. And 
you know, it could help improve the channel. There's a lot of background noises and sounds that I have been missing. Once Michaela's off to college, I should have a studio space to work with. And maybe then, you know, if this channel is growing at all, I will invest a bit, um, get some proper sound equipment. But for now, I'm just enjoying hearing the world. Um, it's just crazy. I mean, I, I can hear my hair. <laughs> I might need to lower the setting a bit before driving, but, um, yeah, all the, all of the ear focus, I feel like I should be doing a, uh, review on Bella. Maybe I'll do her next. I've got one on Rachel Shannon coming up and, uh, debating on Rotten Mango or one of my favorites, Danielle Hallen. Um, I'm actually trying to get a hold of her first. I don't want to do this review without asking a question of her. And with CrimeCon and everything, I, I don't know if that's even going to happen anytime soon. Um, anyway, stay safe. Enjoy your abilities, whatever they are. You know, if you can walk, appreciate it. If you can hear, appreciate it. Um, be thankful for your vision, for whatever senses you have, whatever abilities you have. Other people are struggling and it is such a gift. Um, I always hated walking until I lost the ability and I don't know, I, uh, <laughs> the gradual hearing loss, I really never thought it would come back, that there was any option. Okay, enough rambling. Um, stay safe, listen to your instincts, and I will be back soon. Bye.